as firm owners starting a firm, we were kind of two architects working together side by side. Business of Architecture, episode 192. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture firm income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. Get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today's interview is with Josh Bloomer. He's a principal at AB Design Studio based out of Santa Barbara, California. So without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Josh, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you for having me. Now, this is pretty cool because we actually get to round out, I think, all three principals at the firm, right? We had Claire Rell on. We had uh, Eric Bear was recently on an episode. And now we get to talk with Josh Bloomer. That's right. Last but not least. <laughs> and last but not least. You said you had the opportunity to listen to the interviews uh, with your colleagues uh, before this, this episode. And you said it was kind of interesting to hear them talk about the firm from their perspective. Do you mind sharing some of those insights that you got from listening to them talk about the business side? Yeah, I mean, it's, we're a very intimate firm. Um, Clay and I have been working together for, you know, just about 16 years now professionally, um, and have developed a, a very close, uh, friendship. So, you know, it's always interesting to hear Clay or Eric speaking to others about their, you know, their interpretations of, of the work we do. Um, you know, it, it's just a different perspective. We take so much for granted having such an intimate work. Uh, relationship, you know, the day in, day in, day out, um, kind of, uh, uh, I was going to say the grind of it, but, you know, the, 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 the kind of typical work interactions, it's, it's, they go a certain way. And um, it's always inspiring to hear others speak about your work. Um, it's one of the unique things about being an architect that I think um, we get to enjoy because, uh, you know, most people go to work and, and they don't have a critical review of their work, especially in a public way. Uh, they just do their job and part of architecture, uh, in, in class, at least in the way we're doing it, uh, definitely includes putting it out there for uh, others to interpret and, and hopefully give us critical feedback, but have it be part of a larger uh, critical discourse on what what we're doing in the movement, uh, you know, that is architecture in Southern California and the Western United States, and hopefully you know, pushing those boundaries as we move forward more and more. So, you know, I just, I've, I thought it was, uh, it's just refreshing to hear them speaking about it. You know, I find it, it's kind of like a shot in the arm when you, you, you start to get out of your office and studio mindset and just review it from the outside looking in, so to speak. Do you remember a particular insight that jumped out that jumped out at you either from the conversation I had with Eric or with Clay that maybe a little light bulb went off? You thought, oh, that's interesting that he put it that way. Uh, you know, I'm trying to remember that. And for some reason, it's not clicking. I, I listened to Clay's interview a while back. Um, but I think, you know, it's, you know, Clay, I guess the way I'd answer that, though, is it, you know, in a more general way, is that Clay's, Clay's as, as we've developed the firm, Clay and I, and it, I think he mentioned some of this in his interview, but he talked about at one point, I and mean, we talk about a lot, uh, back in 2011, Clay and I sat down, we, we had kind of a, a, a moment in our firm where, where we realized we needed to make uh, some moves to kind of unhinge what we were doing and take it to the next level. And one of the things we came to was a more of a divide and conquer strategy. Um, so, you know, as firm owners, Starting the firm, we were kind of two architects working together side by side. Um, and around 2011, we created this kind of uh, uh, you know conversation in the firm to to start to relax that 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 notion of how to do the work and, and divide and conquer. And Clay went in a more business development marketing direction. 
and I went to a more operational studio management um, kind of focus. And I think that also opened the door really at that same moment to let Eric in as a partner uh, or as a uh, you know principal, um, because you know we started looking at the firm in terms of bases that needed to be covered and how much bandwidth any one of us could handle and, and, and handle effectively. And I remember at the time looking at some articles written about, you know, uh, how many how many projects can an architect manage effectively with, within reason. And I think that we, the things that we were researching, like eight to ten, is a kind of an established, you know, number for an, ar an architect in terms of their, what their capacity is to manage with due care and all those things. Um, but that was, that was a really exciting shift, and there was a ton of growth and forward movement for a firm when we, when we actually made that shift. Um, and um, one thing that I will we'll say that we, we, we decided at that point, and we, we're maintaining it to this day, is that we decided you know, that we wouldn't divide and conquer on design. That design would be uh, one element that we would not uh, divvy up. That, and, and I think part of that was mainly for Clay and I, getting into the, the profession as architects um, and, and our kind of love for being architects and our passion about it, you know, that the design part of it is central to that. And neither of us wanted to delegate that or have that um, become somebody else's responsibility. And it's, and it's also kind of the place where we come together uh, and, you know, as a friendship, as a partnership, um, and as fellow architects, that's, that's, that's the table we come to to get together and really, um, I think, center ourselves inside of what we're up to. Because um, for, for those who are running uh, architecture firms, you know, there's so many uh, bases that have to be covered. Um, there's the business part of it, and of course, this is the business of architecture we're talking about here. So, you know, the the business of architecture has the uh, tendency, or it can pull you away from the fundamentals of being an architect or being a project manager or a designer. Um, and I think a lot of us have a lot of pride and a lot invested into training and developing ourselves as architects and designers. And of course, for us interior designers too. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been a good way for us to manage the threat of the lo any loss of that um, participation as we've, taken on you know, firm ownership and, and really learned what it takes to run a, run a company um, of people, which is a, a, a different training, a different discipline. And you know, to manage those two things side by side and still maintain yourself as an architect, you know, that's, that's not an easy task. It's challenging and it goes through phases, I know. And, you know as the years have progressed, uh, there's been a lot to learn in that and that reconciliation has to go on between the two of them. How did you how did you get to the point where you recognized that you needed to something needed to change? You talk about this pivotal moment when uh, you started div dividing up tasks. Tell me, you draw a picture for me of what that looked like, so you're able to recognize that. Well, I think you know fundamentally, if you really were, want to be honest about it, I think we weren't having fun. You know, there was something. You know, a big big part of the fuel that fuels an art, a good architecture firm, or at least, uh, you know, speak for myself. I mean, what's been, what's been there to fuel me is inspiration. You know, we joke around about um, you know, how passionate we are and, and you know, <laughs> where that leads us to, uh, you know, and, and sometimes um, from a business standpoint, our, our logic is more based in a, in a passion to pursue our interests as architects and, and move ourselves forward in terms of what we're, trying to accomplish in terms of whether it's a design typology that we want to master or uh, just the quality of the detailing or a certain style of architecture that we want to really take ourselves deeper into and, and find you know, a new aspect of, uh, of design opportunities that lie in, in, in kind of a deeper investigation into certain types of architecture and, and building types. So I don't know. I, but I, I, thought, I think at the end of the day it was just not feeling grounded in that, um, the, pa you know, the passion that started to kind of get eroded by just the day-to-day -day grind of trying to cover a lot of bases. Um, and I think also, too, as business partner, you know, there's something to be said about starting, you know, a lot of architecture firms start with partnerships. Um, sometimes you see husbands and wives taking on or, or other partner 
uh, relationships that folks have, or, you know, people who work together and, and find that they work well together and go off together and start a firm like Clay and I do. Um, <clears throat> and it's easy to kind of take the competitiveness of a studio or just, you know, try and compare each other. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some way when you're trying to maintain a 50-50 partnership like we had, you, know, you want to make sure that you're doing just as much work as the other person. And, you know, fundamentally, Clay's got talents in areas where I just can't compete with him. Um, and, and I think the same is true for, for me and him, you know, the other way. And, and, and I think it was kind of like a moment where we acquiesced to that and just said, look, you know, I can't compete with you when it comes to your ability to go out and find new work with clients and develop initial relationships. Like, when Clay's very visionary. And he's looking out with, with a certain level of, uh, well, he, there's a boldness to his vision and sometimes intimidates me. You know, I'm always there to back him up, <clears throat> but it's great when he's out front with that. Um, meanwhile, um, when he does land projects or when he does accomplish or, or get us to certain plateaus, I'm really liable to cash those checks. You know, my, my focus has been quite a bit on delivering the big promise that he's making. Um, or that we're, and, you know, it's truly we both make that promise together and we both deliver it together. But when we get into the emphasis, like, you know, what goes on behind the door when we close it and go do our work that nobody else knows but us, you know, there is an emphasis there and, and we play that power. You know, the thing I guess it was really notable after this, what I noticed is when we unhinged each other from each other in that way, I noticed that Clay's and my growth in our respective areas where we were that we kind of had um, the abilities exploded. It was almost like we unhelped each other from one another and we were able to grow in the new areas much more rapidly with, with a lot more freedom. You know, so I, I noticed that Clay's ability to, to, to move out and push boundaries in terms of how, how we were sharing our work really increased quickly uh, after that. And, and then we had, I think, some pretty big step forwards in terms of our production in our kind of internal operations. My focus got to be more um, uh, direct and, and, and clear at that point about what I was going to do. And I wasn't having to you know, cover all the other bases at that point. And, I, and again, as we <clears throat> divided into that, Eric showed up in the middle as somebody that really needed. Uh, and, and you know, where, where we're heading now with it is that for me, I'm getting an opportunity to really focus myself as a design-centric element of the firm. I spent a lot of my time focusing on, on architectural detailing, uh, how we're putting projects together, thinking about distractibility. Um, I spend uh, a great more, a greater amount of time on the job site in the two of them. Um, that, that's where my passions lie. That's where my energy to, to do this comes from. I, I, I love and, and, and it, like, not to take anything away from uh, like the other principals, they love those things too. But for me, it's fundamental. I have to be on the job site. I have to put my hands on the work. I have to be uh, in, a, in a learning process with builders um, for me to really enjoy this 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 this, uh, this profession. For me, that's just uh, I like to experiment in the studio. I like to take it out to the job site and see what, how how it lands, and I, and I take the information. And I'm learning from the job site back, and, and that's the cycle for me. So, Josh, you talked about you know getting to this point where you decided you wanted to grow. I know there's there's a lot of architects uh, they have the question, "Do I want to grow?" Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, and I don't know that we've asked the question properly, and certainly I don't have a sense that we've answered it yet. Um, so we're always you know, first of all, looking at that question and looking at it newly each year, or each, each, each time it comes up. Uh, and I, I think the, the notion of what that means to you as a firm owner changes as you evolve too. Um, certainly from, from, the, from the lens of sitting in a studio of four or five, you know, two or three to four to five, maybe six or seven folks, uh, and looking at going to like 20, 25 people or even further, you know, there's, there's kind of some obvious growth concerns that you're looking at as, as you, as you, as you weigh that. Um, once you've actually done that, which we have, you know, I think we've, we've gone as far as having 20, I think the, the, the firm, the maximum size of the firm that we've, we've reached it in the last few years is about 29. Uh, and, and 
we seem to have landed at about a 20, 25 person firm. Uh, and that seems to be where we're, we're kind of currently uh, hovering. Um, the, you know, the, the question initially, you know, was looking at kind of a return on investment, so to speak. I, I, we, we had put a lot of investment into systems. You know, we had uh, a few years back, we'd, we'd put an investment into building a space to do the work. Uh, you know, so it's as simple as looking at counting how many desks and computers and, and what kind of office uh, support you want to have. All those things become uh, expensive. And so then the question is, how much revenue do I need to, to cover these expenses and still be profitable? And what's the magic number? And, and you know, and I think I think that was the initial concern. And I, you know, depending on where you are and what region you are and, and the type of work you're doing, you know, there's there's some there's some variance there. And most architects, I think, have enough training and skill and probably ability by the time they're looking at that to kind of navigate that themselves. Um, and, or at least most of us think we can pull it off. And, and, I, and I think if you're willing to work very hard and, 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 and be willing to drive yourself crazy a little bit, sure, you can, you can do that. Uh, I think what we learned along the way is that, and it goes back to my earlier comments, it starts to become a dilemma between running a company and being an architect. And, and if you, have a passion for running a business and being an entrepreneur and you're an architect, well, then you've taken on some pretty, um, pretty, pretty steep challenges and not those things don't tend to agree with each other always. So what, what, what I think showed up for us is the, the way, at least it has been and it continues to be the, the, the way we've dealt with that, I think is opened up the leadership of the firm to people like Eric Baer, who's, who's a principal now. Um, he's a young principal, but he he was able to understand how the business needed to run, and therefore became a vital component to it. Um, so it wasn't less; it wasn't so much, you know, him having thirty years of experience that that we were relying on. It was his understanding of how the company, a certain part of our studio, frankly, needed to operate in order for us to continue doing what we're doing, and and it freed Clay and Clay up to do. Uh, the things he wanted to do, it freed me up to do the things I wanted to do. And I think recently, we've actually been fortunate to bring in uh, somebody that, you know, probably, I think would be fascinating for you to interview if you're really looking at the business of architecture is Al Harris. Al Harris has come in to our firm at an executive level, and he's our, our director of operations. Um, it's interesting because in a, in a typical uh, corporate structure, you have a CEO and a CFO and a COO. Um, when you have two architects who own the firm, um, you, you essentially are pushing in a direction where you have two CEOs. And that's, that's tricky um, because, you know, there's, there's something that works about the, 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 the conventional structures and they're not there by accident. They, you know, tried and true stuff out there that, you know, it, <laughs> especially as an architect, it doesn't really make sense to go reinvent how people do business. <laughs> we got enough on our plate, you know, it's probably better to go figure out how business gets done and, and try and figure out how to have your architecture work and, and flourish inside of that. Um, but Al coming on board as a, an operational person with business acumen has been another step for us to achieve this ability for Clay and I to stay architect focused and, and, and design centric. Uh, allow Eric um, the opportunity to to, to manage a, a studio, a really productive studio environment, and, and now we have Al um, working with us to really create a, a much more sound business practice that doesn't require Clay and I to, to you know um, burn ourselves out. And I think that is creating a certain amount of um, sustainability to the firm. Uh, you know, we talk about sustainability as a as a practice for for environmentally sound architectural you know, um, design. And um, I always think of sustainability you know, in a business sense. It's can, you, can you provide a certain level of service and quality and, and, and maintain it over time uh, and, and not, uh, you know, not have it break underneath you because of you, you're really pushing too hard into, into areas where you know, one, one failure leads to another. I mean, we've, we've got multiple layers of management now and people focused in areas where we really are able to make impact 
uh, with design or impact with our business ability or impact with our marketing ability or, or impact with our studio in terms of production. Um, do you so, feel that yeah. do you feel that you have your your full team built out now it sounds like you recently brought al on does that that fills in one piece of the puzzle are there any other team members that you guys feel that you need to really feel like man we have our team right here well you know the last few years we spent a lot of time uh i think in the uh room talking about and and creating sound pro like a better um executive uh level uh, of leadership in the business, you know, they, we've got, you know, office administrators and um, people supporting us in the sales and marketing part of the firm. We have a good, a solid accounting department. We have executive assistant. We've got, you know, we've got a lot of support at the top. And uh, and I think with Al, it's really yes, he he's brought um, a final piece to that. It's that it's really needed to have an excellent business. Um, and I think. Our, we've, we've created a very high standard, and I think it's typical of architects as well. Is, is we, you know, we have this high standard for our work, and we've carried that over and created a high standard for our business environment that we've created. Um, you know, our clients are very important to us, so you know, we want to serve them as best we can. And, and I think he's he's helping us, and we've 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 developed together a, a good place to do that. I think where the focus next goes for the firm uh, that I'm seeing. And, and this is really centric to my mission is really look into the studio. What are we doing as a studio of production uh, architects, you know, being able to take design through the process into construction and, and really feed power to that part of the firm. That's, that's my focus. And that's where, where I, where I see a lot of growth opportunity for the firm. We've recently um, invested in ArchiCAD, which is a BIM, a BIM type uh, software. We're, we're exploring the new uh, opportunities in, in uh, uh, Bluebeam, uh, which is, I think, the industry is going to a more paperless environment, and we've been using that on construction sites and learning to evolve with that process. Um, we're looking at 3D modeling opportunities that uh, talk well with our CAD program. Uh, so, you know, growth in our firm, you may look like a, I, I think we're starting to have conversations about developing positions for like a, cat, a typical CAD manager or a production specialist, you know, we've, we've always maintained a, a, a hand illustration capability. Uh, a lot of our work goes into 3D modeling and then it goes back to the table and hand illustration kind of develops a more emotive uh, design uh, presentation that gets that conceptual uh, part of the project really soundly handled. Um, and. Uh, one of the things I'm really been pushing for and excited about with my younger staff, uh, architects graduating from college coming into work for us and, and, some, and our interior designers as well, is that I, I'm really interested in design workflow and, and putting that design work on their desk as a part of um, their, their, um, their typical work process. You know, that we have designers and drafters, you know, the entry level positions to architecture I'm always trying to open that up. I want the design work to be on their desk, frankly. I don't want to have those conversations reside exclusively with, with myself and the principals and then working with a senior designer to create a, a you know, evocative or convincing image uh, like through illustration or design and, and then hand it back to them as something they need to work out. I'm, I'm constantly trying to put them at the front of that conversation and have them in the gears with us as we do that. And one of the things I've been exploring is the use of ARCHICAD as a, uh, you know, ARCHICAD has an opportunity to create um, what, uh, like a 3D model in a, in a kind of a SketchUp format. SketchUp's a program that everybody uses, you know. And there's so many different programs out there to use, but what I'm interested in is trying to consolidate them into one process and have, have our staff being able to generate three-dimensional conceptual design uh, digitally and still have it still have it work as a concept not have it have that hard um, finished quality but keep it loose and, and gestural and we've been playing with that a lot and then uh, having them have a hands-on exp uh, experience with that and then have them take that to the next step where it starts to get refined into a more of a working drawing set um, and, 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 and seeing that transition you know and I to me, one of the most important things that 
I see for architects to, 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 to practice is how to go from concept to a working drawing that you're using for design approvals or, or, or getting your clients to the next step or engaging consultants and so forth. And on the other end of it is this piece where we hand drawings into the, uh, in the field for construction. Like what happens there and how do you translate between those two activities, you know, constructing and drawing schematics or doing specification and, and working drawings. Is, those are two different activities that connect and really the architect goes to work to make that connection work. You know, the better we do in that uh, uh, kind of transition from, from our desk to the, to the field, um, you know, the better the buildings, the better the design, the better the outcome. And I think the other end of that, again, going back to the other side of the concept, you know, we're kind of taking our clients' uh, dreams, desires, what they want to do, their, their, their program or their, their, their initiative. We're translating that into something tangible. And it's, it's, it's kind of similar. There's a, there's, a, there's a leadership opportunity for architects to facilitate that process on both ends of that. And everything that happens in the middle, you know, very over. I'm sure this is an oversimplification of it is, is, is kind of what happens in the studio. It's like how we process it, you know, with our engineers and, and put our specs together and all that. But there's these two ends of the process where we're bringing in an idea and then we're putting the idea into the ground. Those are, I think those are the areas where I'm always fascinated in trying to figure out how to have the software, the design workflow process be a match to that, you know, and not have it be, consolidated just one or two people in the firm that it becomes like a kind of a firm wide phenomenon or an opportunity. Um, and I'm, you know, that's also I think our obligation to teach our younger architects how to be architects. Um, there's the, I think the apprenticeship and mentorship process is still alive and well in our, in our profession and, and, and it serves us. And, um, the soft, the introduction of digital software and, old school, new school conversations that we're still grappling with, you know, they have an effect on that. And I think how to, what I'm always looking for is how do I get maximum participation? I mean, we're definitely, definitely heading in it. And this is something that Clay and I've talked about for years and want, and want as, uh, to always be a part of our firm as a collaborative leadership, you know, collaborative design, you know, uh, top down thinking is, is probably a thing of the past. And you know, if you look in business, Today, there's a lot of discussions about collaborative leadership. It seems to be how things are getting done now. Um, architects have been, I think, hip to that for quite some time when it comes to design. And I think, you know, it's, it, as you start to poke your head into the business world and hear those terms, you realize, oh, there's that's the same thing going on there that's going on in our profession. Our collaborative design process is really just collaborative leadership because um, we're actually pointing the direction um, for the client, and we're, we're doing that with the contractors in the field. We're actually leading a process that gets things built from a, from an idea. It's exciting. Josh, what would you say is, is your core focus right now in the firm? Um, I think, you know, I'm always interested in clients and what, what's going on with clients and trying to, because, to, you know, they anything that's sourcing the opportunity of a project is, is something I'm interested in. So if we're, you know, up against the challenge uh, with the field, like with the condition in the field where we have bad soils or we have, uh, you know, a tricky uh, structural um, system to overcome, you know, I, I tend to want to go figure out how to solve that problem to keep the, keep our design and the original thought of the project alive. Um, and a lot of times, that ends up being the client. You know, the clients come in with expectations and needs, and and they have to adjust them as they move through the process because the projects, you know, project kind of starts to become its own thing at, at some point. Once the design itself it starts pointing itself at the code and and build, you know, zoning regulations and all that and city ordinances, you know, it, it has to respond to all those things as it kind of cascades through the process. And big big part of our job is to help our clients move along the process with them because most times they've never been through that. Um, and I think, you know, there's some of that with builders too, you know, getting them to understand why things have to be done certain ways in a fairly regulated and pretty tricky environment to build in. Um, 
so I'm always interested in what's, you know, what's impacting our, the quality of our projects. And, you know, I, it, that takes me around the office a bit, but I'd, I'd say, you know, if I really look at what I'm spending most of my time on, um, I'm spending most of my time, uh, working with the people in our studio, trying to grapple with complicated projects and holding, I think holding a pretty strong line to make sure that they get the best design and best solutions possible for, for what the work that comes out of here. Fantastic. So just to make sure I understand, it sounds like what you're saying is that you are a problem solver. You're heavily involved in the construction document side of things, taking those designs into how does that get translated into drawings? And then how does that get translated into the field? Is that, Mm -hmm. did I catch it right there? Yeah. And I, and I think the the one thing that carries through that whole process for me is, is a focus on design. You know, I, I, I want our work to have a signature. I want people to come to us and be able to have a signature design. I want their, I want, you know, even if it's a, a simple thing as a bathroom in a restaurant, I want the user, I want the end user, I want the client, I want the recipient of that work to, to look at that and say, you know, somebody thought about this a little bit, that there was a, <clears throat> you know, if it's not inherently beautiful, then it's in, then there's an inherent smartness to it. There's a quality of uh, a care, like a thought that went into making it better. You know, I, I actually, uh, I, yeah, it's just about trying to make a difference. You know, I want, I want the stuff that we're doing to have impact. And I want to, I, I don't want to just do something because it's, you know, and, you know, like not everything avails itself that way. But, you know, we, we have, it's like, you know, <laughs> your passions take you where they take you. And architects tend to mess around with stuff. Um, well, when, when you're, when you're thinking about making a difference, there's always the, uh, there's the, the sort of, there can be a conflict there. Um, if you feel like you're trying to push some agenda on the client versus working with clients who agree with the kind of impact that you want to make, right? So how, how do you guys select the projects that you want to work on? And then how do you get your design and your, what you, what you guys are passionate about? Uh, how do you get the client to buy off on that? You know, is, is, I'm imagining from what you said, it sounds like you guys have a definite direction you want to head the projects. And, you know, tell me about the process of getting the clients to align with that vision. Well, I think, first of all, we have a big step for an architect in a firm, in, in, in a position of firm ownership or making decisions about what projects come into the office. You have to, you ha- you have to arrive at some point where you can actually be a good measure for what's the right project for your firm, you know, and, and, and that's, sometimes that's about timing and sometimes it's about um, ca- capacity and sometimes it's just assessment of, you know, the, the conditions of the client, and what, what are they offering and how many resources they, they have or what resources they have. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't think we tend to, you know, and I, I, I guess just to close that thought, you know, we're starting to get a certain level of confidence around that that's different than where we started. I mean, I, you know, we're, our firm's 11 years going on 12 years. So in, in, in certain light, that's a pretty young firm. Um, you know, we've been at this for both of us for 20 years and all that. And we come from um, other firms that have a long history. So, you know, we're, we're part of a, uh, a lineage of, of thought and, and productivity and work, but at the same time, uh, you take on your own firm, there's a certain level of decision making that you have to make and you got to learn how to make those decisions. Um, and I think we're starting to head into a phase where we're, I, I want to be careful I say this because I don't like the idea that architects get picky about what projects they do and don't do and start picking and choosing. You know, I don't think that's that's where we're coming from. I think it's just having a better response to projects and being more um able to see down the lane and maybe it's like probably uh, like a more honest assessment of your capabilities and being able to show up to the project in the beginning more honestly. I think there's a big dilemma for architects to navigate the turn from being in a solicitation of their work to being a trusted confidant or consultant to the owner or to their client. You know, and when you get to, Look, the, the best thing to do, and AIA's got articles that I've read on this, and you can read about this if you look for it. But you know, the best thing that I I understand from my experience, and I've heard others talk about it, is turn that corner quickly and effectively. Because being able to say no is 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 a very 
very useful tool, or even I don't know, and I need to go find out the answer. That you know, we need to be careful about the decisions we make on the behalf of our clients and our projects, and knowing how to um, be an advocate for the project and for the client and for your firm, and do it in equal proportion and well. It, it takes some experience and it takes some confidence, um, and I think that as you develop that muscle, it starts to influence the way that you analyze work coming in and how you, how you start the project and how you set those initial expectations are critical. Uh, and it can be an extremely frustrating place for architects to learn because I think we typically learn by making horrible mistakes for ourselves in that area and it can be tough. Um, but those are the dues you pay and I think that the prize for getting that, that settled is, is, you know, as that starts to fade into the rearview mirror, there's, there's another sign to that where you start to show up with confidence and it, it becomes, a, I think, much more fun and natural. And, uh, you know, again, looking at the projects that we like to do, you know, I think, look, it, there, there's folks out there in, the, in our community of architects who, and I've read, you know, different trains of thought from different architects, especially the ones that are more published, you know, there's this idea of architect, architecture needs to be like a transgression. You know, it needs to, it needs to have impact. It needs to do something. You know, like I'm, I admire that and I like that thinking. Um, and I, I get inspired by people that can go out and really slash into something and, and change things. But, but at the same time, in my own practice, you know, those opportunities are, are, are not always right there and, and evident. You know, it, it, a lot, oftentimes what we're being asked to do is solve a problem. Or, or provide an opening for something to happen. You know, somebody's got a business idea and they need a space to do it and they want it to be productive and we want to unleash that. So we're, 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 we're facilitating that. Um, I mean, I really like doing office TI work because I, I just love the direct result. It happens quickly and you can see it. You get to, you see a company with a certain potential and especially creative companies are this way. And you go and work with them and you become kind of part of their company and you design a workspace that inside and out really matches to the business plan and their culture. And then you go back and look at that firm and all of a sudden something's been un un unleashed. You know, their productivity has gone to a new level and you can actually see the impact of the design on the quality of their work. Um, I certainly get that expression from ho doing homes for people. Uh, you see families who or upgrading their lifestyle or being able to make a statement about how they want to live in the design. Um, and you're designing to their family's needs and wants and growth and how many people they have coming and going, right? how they park their cars, how they eat their breakfast. Um, you can actually unleash the productivity of a family through the work we do. Um, some of the stuff that, you know, we do childcare, we do, we've done a museum recently. Those are uh, th those are interesting, and they're they're much more public projects. They're, they're a little bit um, obvious because you're all you, you start with the notion that you're creating something um, with a with a highly programmed kind of mindset. Um, you know that that, that, uh, that again, you know, it, it, it's you you don't have as much control sometimes on those larger projects because you're serving so many needs. Uh, so some of the more intimate projects were. You get to focus on, a, you know, a family or a business or a restaurant, hospitality, smaller hotels. Those can be pretty exciting. Um, so, uh, you know, but our door is open to anybody that wants to have a discussion about making a difference and doing, you know, problem solving and, and, and doing uh, work that can be measured. You know, that, that's another big element of what we're having to confront on all of our projects is the cost of doing this work. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the only office and project management software designed specifically for architects. It helps you manage people and projects while you focus on designing great architecture. So whether you're working remotely or on-site, ArchiOffice allows you to monitor the status of your projects and tasks and send out invoices in an accurate and timely manner. 
get your fully functional 15-day trial of ArchiOffice by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.